Well, good evening and welcome to the service tonight at Tabernacle. Take the living hymnal, please. Everyone needs to pick up a book, the living hymnal. This is a song I don't remember leading, but uh, you turn to page 46, and I will uh, sort of give you a little inside information. Uh, we praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. This song is in the tune of We Gather Together, and I think once we start singing it, you will recognize the tune Page number 46, we'll stand please, and then remain standing. We'll turn over to page 18 just a little bit and sing all hail the power, but we'll start with page number 46. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. You'll understand and recognize the tune singing. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. that tune very few that's what I figured and I had a problem with it too but it's a good song we'll sing it again some other time turn to page 18 if you would please we recognize this all hail the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all we'll sing several stanzas sing it together all hail the power
together. Amen. for prayer. Dr. Aiken is coming. He's going to lead us in prayer. Then after prayer, we have a young lady coming to sing a special song tonight. But we're glad you're here in the service tonight. We have some visitors. We'll fellowship with you after a while. But it's prayer time at this time. Dr. Aiken is coming to pray. Then after prayer, you may be seated, choir and congregation. Then we'll have Rachel Clark here to sing a special at that time. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful and we give glory unto thee for thou art worthy of all power and all honor and all glory and all majesty be unto thee. We thank thee, Lord, for your being our shepherd as we heard this morning. We want to give you praise and honor and glory for all that you've done for us, undeserving as we are, and yet by your mercy and by your grace, you've been wonderful to us. We have no complaints. Lord, we only have praise unto thee, for thou art worthy. Now, bless the Lord, we pray in this service tonight. Be in every song, every word that's spoken. Be with the pastor as he brings the message. And use us, Lord, to be a blessing to others while we've come together to worship thee. May we also minister unto those that are about us. We'll thank you, Lord, for what you shall do at this hour. Save some soul, we pray. And get glory unto yourself, for thou art worthy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Aiken. Thank you. You may be seated. Rachel Clark is coming to sing tonight. Her mom is here. Good to see you, Miss Clark. Had major surgery on Friday, I believe it was, and she is in the house of the Lord tonight. And it is so good to see her. Been praying for her, and you keep lifting her up in prayer. Her daughter Rachel is coming to sing at this time. Okay. 
Thank you very much for singing that good song. Ron Hamilton wrote that some years ago through a trial and test in his life, and that's a good song. Rejoice in the Lord. Well, choir, let's take that yellow, I'm sorry, that red, I'm sorry, that black book. I'm not colorblind. <laughs> you ever have that problem? Your mind goes, and before you speak, it's like it's out there. The black notebook, number 10 is the page number. Jesus is his name. I've got that part right. It's what the world needs to hear. Amen. Jesus is is his name the black notebook it is okay number 10 
Somebody will say amen right there. What a lovely name. Two songs in a row about the name of Jesus Christ. No other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. No name like the name Jesus. Well, thank you, choir. Good singing. I could hear another verse of that. I could. I could hear another verse of that. Heard that when I was a little child. Molten Heights Baptist Church a long time ago. And uh, I'm glad that Mom and Dad took us to a Bible-believing church. Had good music in it. And uh, I appreciate the good music there tonight. Well, um, boy, it is so good to have Angie Clark here tonight. And I know it's already been said. I didn't expect her here. And uh, there she is. So, Angie, we're so glad you're here and then got to hear your daughter Rachel sing. What a blessing. Maybe we ought to just make it a perfection thing there. Luke, you're Seth. You got a message ready? You got a five-minute message ready? Huh? I can't see. Is that a yes or a no? You, I mean, all I see is your head in one position. Seth, you got a five-minute message ready? All right, I got that one. I got that one. Yes, sir. Not going to put you on the spot. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I want to welcome all our guests tonight. Glad that you're here. We do have guests here this evening. Thank you for coming tonight, and uh, we do want to make you feel welcome. We'll get to you in just a moment, get our hand in your hand. I want to remind you about the uh, Piedmont Baptist Fellowship that will be here tomorrow, 1.30. And uh, several preachers, many preachers be here preaching and uh, preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing that. And then 4 o'clock, Christmas Eve, that'll be our service mood, the only move that we'll have that day to 4 o'clock. And uh, you come and we'll try to make that a little special time for you. And then the following Sunday, the 31st, we'll have our service regular time. And then we'll have a watch night service down at First Baptist Church of Conesty. And if you'd like to be part of that, I'm sure they'd be glad to have you. I do have a couple of things as far as prayer. Fellas, if you go ahead and come this direction as far as uh, our giving. Uh, James Logan, I, I talked to Brother Logan um, uh, earlier today. And Brother James Logan, he had a brain stem stroke is what they've come to the conclusion of. And um, it's caused some problems with his eyes. And he's not really in a lot of pain, but it's definitely caused some problem with his eye. And uh, he is a... Uh, He's really the, I guess, a caretaker between he and his wife, and, and he goes different places, and uh, um, his eyes not being uh, strong and able to see to be able to go out is definitely limiting, and um, I, I know they would appreciate your prayers for them. Ruby Moat's still in the hospital. I know Brother Ladd wants you to pray for his mother, and then, uh, of course, Angie, she's improving, as well as Violet Coker. And uh, Violet was hopeful to be back today, D didn't able to make it back today, but uh, I know it won't be too far off in the, in the distant future. I want to encourage you to give tonight, and uh, you give as God's blessed you. How, how many, honestly, tonight, how many of you could say God has truly blessed you in 2017? Do you say that? God, God's blessed you, and, and, and not just financially. You know, sometimes we measure blessings in materials that we have. How many of you have been blessed in ways that had nothing to do with financial gain? Could you say amen to that? I could agree to that. I could say amen to that. And I, I certainly do appreciate God's goodness there and appreciate what he's done for us. And, and uh, you know, giving back to God tonight. That offering plate goes by. Just worship a little bit. When you drop that offering in that plate, worship God a little bit. And uh, that's what those wise men did. They opened their treasures unto Jesus. They worshiped by giving. And, uh, you know, I, I know that that's probably not something you'll find in one of these newer churches. The newer churches, the only way you can worship is they turn down the lights and get the organ playing really jazzy and all that kind of stuff. I don't think that's worship at all. Amen. But I believe you can worship the Lord. I believe you can worship the Lord by giving tonight. And I want to encourage you to do that. Thank the way you've given this year. Lord, we do praise you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the good visitors that we have tonight. Lord, think about all the people that would be listening tonight whether it's streaming services or by the way of the radio. And, uh, Lord, if they could be here, they would be here. And, Lord, we appreciate being able to keep the lights on and being able to keep the power to that radio station to be able to send out the message loud and clear, Lord. You've been good to us, and we praise you for it, Lord. We thank you for the blessings of this past year. And, God, we lift our hand to heaven, and we want to recognize you as the giver of all good things. And, we pray tonight as this plate is passed, Lord, that there would be a, a joy in the heart of your people as we give back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a song that the Lord gave me a few years ago. Dr. Aiken was preaching one night, and he made the statement that grace showed up at my door. And that thought sort of stuck with me, and the Lord gave me this song. I trust you.
speak a blessing from it. I was alone and facing dark despair. I had no hope and no one seemed to care. I heard a knock, I walked across the floor, and there was grace just standing at my door. God's grace showed up. In the person of his son, God's grace showed up. My new life has begun. My stripes he wore. My sins he bore. Thank God for grace that showed up at my door. I heard the message from the blessed book. The preacher said, my sin just Jesus took. And to the cross I went, he met me there. Amazing grace, his righteousness I wear. God's grace showed up in the person of his son. God's grace showed up. My new life has begun. My stripes he wore. My sins he bore. Thank God for grace that showed up at my door and now I'm telling others of his love the peace he gives the joy that's from above I'll tell the story till my dying day if you accept him now then you can say God's grace showed up in the person of his son. God's grace showed up. My new life has begun. My stripes he wore. My sins he bore. Thank God for grace that showed up at my door. Amen. Amen. If you'd stand, please, we're going to get out and shake hands. Brother Stephen's going to make his way here. Isn't that great that somebody's writing a new song about the Lord? Isn't that a blessing? If you'd stand, please, choir's going to stand. We'll sing a verse of a song, and then we'll get out and shake hands one with another, greet our guests that are here. We're glad to have you at Tabernacle Baptist Church. All right, Brother Stevens, come right on ahead. <clears throat> Victory in Jesus. You know the song, and uh, we'll sing a couple stanzas. Choir can go ahead, go down if you want to. 120 if you need the book. Page number in the old church temple. I heard an old, old story. How a sin came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Sing it now. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought and bought me with his redeeming blood. He bought me ere I knew him, and all my love is you him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let's take a few moments in fellowship. Go ahead and be instruments and play, please. And let's shake our guest hands and welcome them to the service tonight, if you would, please.
sought me and he bought me. I don't see my redhead. And know my love is. Amen. Amen. Good, good to see good fellowship tonight. Well, that's a blessing. Glad to see that. Glad to see that. I am looking for my red-headed son. Where would he? There he is, right there. All right. <clears throat> um. Last year, last year, we just kind of wanted as a Christmas gift, I think we gave this out to his, uh, we got, I've got two CDs that our family did, and um, we, we tried to give one, I think, to every family. I believe that's right. Is that right, son? And um, if you didn't get one, all right, here's four right here, all right? So you can just, they can come and, and get these right here. And, uh, and if you didn't get one last year, we want you to have one. And uh, they make really good uh, ornaments and scaring all sorts of animals away from your garden during the spring. So you can put those there. And uh, I didn't intend for you to start giving them out now, but that's all right. And, and, he, and if, you, if you didn't get one, all you got to do is let my son know, and he'll take down your name, and he'll get that to you. And uh, we'll make sure you have a little bit of something from the Logan family. Um, all right. Now, tonight, I have a message right here that I want to preach about Jesus Christ. And um, I have tried to focus on Jesus Christ this season. Um, you know, but I got part of me that wants to hear a little more about Psalm 23 this evening. And uh, I hadn't said anything to, to Brother Fuller about that. And um, I've got my message. It's laying right here. I'm ready to go, I'm ready to, go to where we want to go tonight. Um, but Brother Fuller. Would you want to come back up here and preach some more out of Psalm 23? I've had a lot of people ask me about that. I'm just going to make that, I'm not going to make that call. I'm just going to trust you. I know you know the Lord. If you want to come up here, you're welcome to do it. I'm going to sit down. It's not going to hurt my feelings at all. And if you don't, I'm going to start right here where I am. I can't. No, sir. I'm going to defer. I could put that on Dr. Aiken. Dr. Aiken, how about you going ahead and making that decision for him? Would you do that? All right. Brother Aiken said that his wife liked to hear Psalm 23. <laughs> and uh, I, let, me, let, me, let, me say, let me say something tonight that, that I just thought about today while, while I heard Brother Fleur preach about Psalm 23. His preaching carried me back, or at least in my mind, carried me back to a different generation of preachers, a different generation of men. And uh, that's not to say that he's an old man at all. I, I think he has years in front of him still to preach. And hearing those stories that he told about people in their lives and then weaving that into Psalm 23 uh, so affected my heart. And we had this morning, now, uh, whether you knew it or not, we had this morning several people here today that did not know Christ as their Savior. And what a message to have heard about salvation this morning. Psalm 22 preceding Psalm 23 couldn't have been said better. Talked about the cross and then the crook and then the crown. And how that God, God, until you got to Psalm 23, you had to go from Psalm 22. And... Uh, I think today, I think today, and I, I mean this, I think today that we may have better preaching. And what I mean by that is this, preachers like myself and others, we're able to glean and read all sorts of books, there's all sorts of stuff on the internet, there's so much that has gone before us. You know, I don't pull out a big Strong's Concordance and search my Bible anymore, I have a program to do that for me. I don't pull out a big 1828 dictionary and define a word. I have a computer program that does that for me. I have something at my hand. There's a thing called sermon audio. And if you want to listen to preaching starting tonight, you could hear preaching nonstop all day long, every day. And some of those men, excellent preachers. And I think that there's such, a, there's such an ability to draw from today. But that being said, the preaching may be better in some sense of the word. But I don't think the men are better. 
I think the men of years ago had something that a lot of the younger preachers do not have. And boy, he was talking about it this morning. I want to be saturated with the grace of God and saturated with the Spirit of God. And those men, those men are very hard to find today. A Bible preacher that's saturated with the Holy Ghost of God. And uh, Brother Fleur, if you want to, you come right on the head. Now, if you shake your head, no, I'm going. But you come right on the head. Okay, all right, I'm doing it. I said all those things, and now it's my turn. <laughs> John chapter 19 in your Bible then. John 19. John 19. In John chapter 19, we have a picture of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It is an account that God has given us. The crucifixion shows up in all four Gospels. It shows up in Psalm 22 like we heard today. It shows up in Isaiah 53. And the crucifixion of Christ is definitely a focal point of history. It is a focal point of Christianity. And sometimes I think when we look at that, we kind of maybe miss the picture. And, and this morning, or tonight rather, I want you to take and look with me here in John chapter 19. And beginning in verse number, uh, we'll start reading in verse 16. Then delivered he them therefore unto him to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him, and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, in verse 24, when it says that the scripture might be fulfilled, that is Psalm 22. In verse number 18, and in Psalm 22, in verse number 18, let me read it for you. We were there this morning. The Bible says, they part my garment among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, that was written probably 1,100 years before this moment. And yet, what was written 1,100 years before this moment came to pass exactly as the Lord and the Bible said it would, which gives me great confidence that this book right here was not written by a man. This book was written by an eternal God that knows the beginning from the ending. Amen. Now, that being said, that being said, I want to take a look for just a moment at this first picture of Jesus at Calvary. It's amazing to me, it's amazing to me that when the Bible says in verse 23, when they had crucified Jesus, that the next thing that we're shown is not him, but his garments. And, and when you look in the Bible at Calvary, the things that God shows you at Calvary he doesn't show you the picture you see in Isaiah 53. He, he doesn't give you that picture. He gives you a different picture, and I think it's for a reason. So tonight, we're going to consider these garments and this coat of Jesus Christ. And hopefully when we finish tonight, we'll have been better for having been here. Would you pray with me, Lord? Thank you for the great service we had this morning and the sweet spirit of God that was here. Oh, Lord, we pray tonight you'd open our eyes. Lord, we pray tonight you'd help us to see in the Scripture what you would have us to see. And Lord, this time of the year, when so many people talk about Jesus being born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, oh God, there was a day that you were wrapped in your own garments and then you were wrapped in the flesh of men and then you were buried and rose again. God, help us to see the story didn't end with the birth of Jesus Christ. Lord, the story is still being told by the victory that you won there at Calvary. I pray you'd help us as we look in your Bible tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, I think it's interesting to note 
that this coat of Jesus, if you look there in verse 23, they took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. I'm going to say something about that in a moment. And also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. When you look in the Bible, there's about five coats in the Bible that are of note. The first coat in the Bible that's of note is in Genesis chapter 3 where God made Adam and Eve coats of skin to cover their nakedness. But then you go through the Bible and you look in the book of Exodus, Exodus 28 and 29, you have the coats that the priest were to wear, Aaron and his son, to make them able to minister. And then you keep going in the Bible. In Genesis 37, you see Joseph. Joseph had a coat of many colors that his dad had prepared for him because he loved him. Another unusual coat. You have the coat of Jesus here in this passage. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Samuel's mother would make him a coat every year and bring it to him. And these coats are very, I think they're very unusual. But this coat here particularly, the coat of Jesus Christ, very unusual. So unusual that these soldiers decided to cast lots for it. They looked at this coat and they said, let's cast lots for it. Let's gamble over this coat. Let's see who's going to take this coat home with them. And instead of verse number 23, tearing his garments into four parts and each one having a part, this coat was something unique. Now, I want to say about these garments, I think it says something about our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look there in verse number 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments. That's what we see. It's the first thing the Lord points your attention to. They took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. And when I look at that, I think about the inclusiveness of the work of Jesus Christ. There are four soldiers, and every soldier he gets a part. Would you agree with me that we all had a part in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Could you say amen to that? My sins hung him there. Could you say amen to that? All right, it wasn't the sins of people that are filthy and vile and the Jeffrey Dahmers of this world and the Hitlers of this world. Yes, their sins were paid for, but hey, beloved, my sin and your sin was put on him just like their sins as well. Amen. We're all guilty in God's eyes. We've all sinned, and our sins were laid upon him. That's inclusive. Every person's sin was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was able, oh, he was able to bear the weight of all the sin of the world. That's a Savior that man cannot make. Amen. Had to be God to do that. But not only that inclusiveness, look what the Bible says. Each man also got a part of these garments. Every man was given a part of that garment. He was given something that he carried home away from the cross of Calvary. Boy, and I'm glad to say tonight that the work of Jesus Christ is inclusive when it comes to the gift of salvation. We sing songs about red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. I'm glad to say tonight that whosoever is still just as true today as it was the day that he hung on the cross of Calvary. Amen. I began looking in my Bible in John 3 in verses 15 and 16. The Bible says that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Could you say amen to that? Amen. Whosoever, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter how educated you are, doesn't matter how sinful you are, Whosoever believeth on him shall have everlasting life. I begin going through the Bible, John eleven twenty six. 26. Whosoever believeth on me shall never die. You say, preacher, we're all going to die. This body, this body may be put in the ground, but once you have eternal life, you and I are never going to die. Amen. He's the resurrection and the life. John chapter 12 and verse 46 says, whosoever believeth in me should not abide in death. I'm so glad that I don't have to worry about abiding in death. Listen, we heard this morning about the shepherd rubbing that oil onto that sheep and what it meant to him. Listen, I, I, have, I don't have a religion. I'm going to say that again. I don't have a religion. Now, I'm an independent Baptist, but my life does not come from being a Baptist preacher and pastoring an independent Baptist church. My life comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a whosoever. Romans 10, 13 says, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? 
It's whosoever. Anybody wants a part in this salvation, you can have it. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. It's an inclusive work. Men are exclusive. They like to exclude one another. They like to have societies and clubs that are exclusive. Um, they like to look at other people and exclude them from their number because they don't match up and don't line up. I'm glad that Jesus Christ's work was an inclusive work. All four men, all four men at the bottom of that cross carried away a part home. And you know what? Those that were here this morning, if they wanted, they could have carried salvation in their heart when they left here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah for that. Well, that's the garments. Look at the next thing, verse number 23. And the Bible says, and also his coat. His coat. The Bible says, now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And that made that, that coat must have made it very valuable in their eyes, unique. It was without seam. You know, I tried to take a look. You know, just about everything that I have in my closet has a seam in it somewhere. My sweaters have a seam. My shirt has a seam. I mean, just about everything I have. I mean, even looking at my socks, my socks have a seam. This was a coat that had no seam. That's what the Bible says. You know, that's the only time that word's used in the Bible. Word seam. It's never used in the Bible apart from right there. This coat had no seam. So it's very unique. And it makes it valuable. It's one of a kind. That's why in verse 24, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. They said, this coat's valuable. We don't, need to, we don't need to tear it apart. Somebody needs to go home with this coat today. This is a particularly valuable coat. And I would say the same thing about Jesus Christ. I would think that you would agree with me that there is nobody like the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I look at this, when I look at this coat here, I see a picture of Jesus Christ's perfection. I have a perfect Savior tonight. I don't have, listen, I'm not perfect. I don't, I don't have a perfect family. And, and look, I don't pastor a perfect church. But I'm telling you right now tonight, I have a perfect Savior. Amen. Perfection. This coat had no seam in it. There was no place it was joined together. And one of the things that brings to my mind is his perfection. He was the perfect union of God and man. I have a Savior who was God manifest in the flesh. He was all God. I don't have any doubt about that my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the Word made flesh. I believe he was all God. He had all power. He was all, no listen, he was all God. He was a holy God, but he was also all man. He took on the form of man. And when he took and put those two together, it was done where you couldn't see the seam anywhere. It was all God and all man put together in one person. It was a perfect union. And I praise the Lord for that because without him being man, he couldn't pay for my sins. Oh, but because he was a man, not only did he pay for my sins, he paid for your sin as well. Amen. A perfect union. You'd sit there and look at Jesus and... It was mentioned today that for 30 years, 30 years, nobody ever, ever suspected that Jesus was God. They looked at him. He's a carpenter's son. He's working as a carpenter. Here are his brothers and sisters. And there is no suspect that he's God because he is a man. He has the same form of a man. And yet, on the third day, when he got up out of that tomb, I'm going to tell you, he wasn't a man. He laid his life down and he took it up again. No man took his life from him because he was God in the flesh. Amen. All God. I'm going to tell you right now, when somebody starts walking on water, that's not a man. Amen. Somebody can take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people. That's not a man. Somebody can stand outside of a tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. And somebody comes floating out. That's not a man. That's God. Amen. And the perfection, God, God, God came down to men and took on the likeness of sinful men. And he wove that thing together without seeing where you couldn't see the difference because he's a perfect union of God and man. That makes Christianity different from every other religion. Amen. But not only 
not only was it a perfect union, but it was a perfect work. Think about what Jesus Christ is doing on the cross. He's not doing his work and then you and I do our work later on. Oh, I'd like to say tonight, it is not Jesus' work plus what I'm doing. It is Jesus' work without anything that I'm doing. He didn't need a little bit of my help. It's funny to hear every now and then you'll hear somebody talk about, oh, yeah, we believe Jesus is the Savior of the world, but if you want to be saved, you've got to be baptized. No, I'm sorry. My baptism couldn't add anything to what Jesus Christ finished on the cross of Calvary. There is nothing that I can add. It's like trying to take and add a stroke to the Mona Lisa. I don't think that that's a particularly appealing painting to me. It's not to me. When I look at the Mona Lisa, I don't see something that I would pay millions of dollars for, maybe $100. I don't know, maybe, and then you turn around and sell it. But, uh, you know, I, I don't see anything particularly amazing. But I, I tell you what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't say, well, I tell you what, I don't think he got it right there. I'm going to add just a little stroke right here. The Hallelujah Chorus. You may not like classical music, but to hear the Hallelujah Chorus and say, well, I just, that just doesn't appeal to me. But to think that I could add something to that, that's a finished work. And what, are you listening to me? What Jesus finished on the cross of Calvary, you can't add anything to it, man. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. I, listen, he finished the work by himself. Amen. Amen. There was no union going on there. It's without seeing. That's his work. That's his work, not my work. His work is finished. It's done. Hmm. Then I got to think about the perfection, not only the perfect work, the perfect union, but you know that coat that coat is a covering. I have a coat on tonight. And Jesus Christ made a perfect covering there at Calvary. You go back with me in your mind just a minute to Genesis chapter 3. Man had sinned and man is in his naked state and in his shamed state. And the Bible says that God, God made Adam coats of skin. And covered them. Now you know what Adam and Eve had done? Adam and Eve had taken, they'd sewn fig leaves together and they tried to cover themselves. But you know, that was something temporary that wouldn't last. And God stepped in. He said, you know what? I've got a better plan. I think I'll make something myself that will cover you. Are you listening tonight? Listen, the righteousness that I have was not made by man. It was made by God. And his righteousness covers me. It covers you. It covers us. I think about that prodigal son. I, I, I tried to show a little bit of the other night. In Luke chapter 15, the Bible says, and, and bring a, he brought him a, a, a coat. And he brought him that, that coat, that robe. Put on a, a, a new robe on him. And that robe is something that covered up all the filth that was underneath there. The stench. All, all the things about that boy that was wrong, that, that robe, that coat covered all of those things up where you couldn't see what the mess that was on the inside. Listen, I wonder if I'm preaching to anybody out there tonight that if we were to go back in your past that we would find all kind of problems and all kind of sins that smelled and that were make, maybe would make you ashamed. But how many of you tonight have had all those covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Anybody out there like that? A perfect covering. Think about in the book of Zechariah, Joshua the high priest is standing there and the Bible says he's got on filthy garments. They're just filthy. And the Bible says that, that God says take away those filthy garments and give him a new covering. And they come and they put something new on him. And now he's standing in a right state. And I'm telling you tonight, when I look at this thing right here that's without seam, I look at a perfect covering and we say it all the time. When God looks at you and I, God doesn't see you and I, he sees Jesus. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's just a cliche. I'm glad that God sees on me the righteousness of his son, amen. And it covers every single sin, every single state. The worst things in my life that would be at the top of the list that people can't forget, God cleansed at one moment at Calvary. Amen. A perfect covering. A perfect covering. You know, every now and then we try to cover some things up. Anybody here ever swept something under the rug? You ever do that? Our children, you know, we wanted to keep a clean room. and I, I, I've seen sometimes the closet filled with things, you know. Sometimes things get under the bed. And you know, you think, well, you walk in the room, everything looks good, but boy, there, there may be all kind of things underneath that bed. But if it's underneath a rug, 
it just kind of sticks out. There's a lot of people walking around. They're trying to cover themselves with their own coat. You need to give that up because there's something bad sticking out. But if you get covered by the coat of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, he'd cover that thing real good for you. Amen. 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 And this coat, this coat, this coat was valuable. The perfect union of God and man. The perfect work of Jesus Christ didn't need any help. There is no seam there. This perfect covering that can cover everything that's wrong. And in my thinking, when I think about this, and, 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 and this is from a strictly from a physical perspective, an earthly perspective, one of those soldiers won that coat. They cast lots for that thing, and somebody won that coat. And that coat of Jesus Christ, they took that coat home with them. The others, there were garments that were rent and torn. Maybe they would sell them, give them away. But that coat, that coat was something that one of those soldiers took home with him. I remember as a five-year-old boy coming to my dad and saying, Dad, I'm going to hell. I'm scared to death. And I was, I was scared to death, tears coming down my face. And he asked me, he said, so you're going to hell? And I said, yes, sir, what do I do? And he took his Bible. And he opened his Bible and he started showing me about Jesus Christ paying for my sins. And as a five-year-old boy, I climbed up on daddy's shoulder on that sofa. And I asked Jesus to save me and to wash away my sins. You know what he gave me that day? He gave me a coat that day. He gave me a coat that day. And he's never taken that coat away from me. And I've done so many things that don't deserve to have something like that. You know that soldier that took that coat home? He didn't deserve that. He carried home the coat of the Lord Jesus Christ that was unique and valuable. And it was in his home. And he had it there. And I'm telling you tonight, listen, if you and I, if we've been born again, we may get used to it. We don't deserve a coat of righteousness like our Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. But... I say this, thank you, Lord, for letting me wear something of such fine article and clothing. Amen. Every now and then somebody take me out and they'll say, preacher, I want to buy you some shoes. And, and sometimes it's embarrassing. Somebody buy you a really nice pair of shoes. And every now and then somebody take you out and they'll buy you a suit and say, preacher, this one, Lord, this is a really nice suit. And boy, and you put it on and, and, and they're doing something and they're make, they make you feel good. And, and you know, it's a special thing. I had one tailor made one time in South Korea. I got to pick out the garment. I got to pick out the color. And they measured so many different measurements, and I came back, and it was mine. And on the inside, on the inside, it had my name right there, made. And it was name of the shop for Joel W. Logan. But you know, when it comes to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it doesn't say made at all right there. But I'm going to tell you what it does say. It says the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, I don't deserve to wear anything like that. That's a fine garment. That's something that somebody else ought to be wearing. But I'm glad, are you listening to me? I'm glad that even lowly people can put on something that fine. Amen. You say, well, it doesn't look like it down here. That's because you had not seen the finished product yet. One day we're going to leave this world and take a trip toward heaven. And what we're really going to be that day, a whole lot different than what we are now. And it'll all be because of him. Amen. Hmm. As a precious coat, as a valuable coat, that's a coat you and I have been given by faith. And I praise the Lord that God, that God would let me see at Calvary a coat of righteousness. Now don't misunderstand me. That Jesus hung there is important, but that coat of righteousness. That coat of righteousness is something that everyone must have before you leave this world. Without it, there is no heaven for you and I. And with it, there's a guarantee of never one moment in hell. Amen. 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 How many of you got that coat? Anybody got that coat in here? Makes me feel like my wardrobe just kind of took a step up after preaching that. Amen. I got, I got an unusual garment hanging in there. <laughs> All because of Jesus Christ. Well, let's stand to our feet, would you?
I'm going to ask you to do something tonight. And um, Brother Falua really, you know, he touched my heart about weeping today. And um, I'm not just trying to get you to an altar. I'm not, that's not my purpose. But um, how many of you know somebody that is living life without that code of righteousness? Could you raise your hand just a minute? You got somebody like that? You know what I'd ask you to do tonight? I'd ask you to just come to an altar. This is Christmas time, I know, but could you come to an altar and just spend a little while and just beg God to open their eyes and help them to see their need and that somehow the truth of the gospel would get to them this season when so much is being said about Jesus? That they'd be able to be given something that they can't make it to heaven without. spend a little time weeping my heart sometimes you get so busy but hell is a reality just like heaven and Jesus is the answer and that answer is something that men need they need that and our people I know we have people here I've heard them talk about their sons and about their daughters and about their mothers tonight maybe would you come and brother Ken you go ahead and just play and maybe we spend a little while at an altar Maybe God break our heart over those people. Maybe God break our heart over our community. Maybe God help us, help us to spend a little time just holding them up before him and saying, God, would you please do something? Would you please touch their life? Would you please some, send somebody else by? Would you do that tonight? A lot of folks at the altar. Would you come? Calvary covers it all, my past with its sin and shame, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. You may be seated. Well, after you get saved, the Bible says we follow the Lord in believers' baptism. Baptism doesn't save a man, but baptism testifies to the world that they have been saved. And this is this is Harold Brenda. 
And uh, Harold told me he is from, you said Miami, is that right? Yes, sir. From Miami, and he had a terrible accident and uh, had all kind of stitches, all kind of things. And uh, God, through that accident, showed him his need for Jesus Christ, and he got saved. All right, now what year was that, Harold? 2013. 2013, so he got born again. And who saved you? Jesus Christ did. Jesus did. Anybody got a Savior out there by the name of Jesus Christ? He came to the other day and he said, Preacher, I need to be baptized. So we talked about his salvation. And uh, so then the night he wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. So Harold, we're going to do that right now. He goes, if you just hold the line like this, watch me. My dear brother, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Buried in his life. Raised to walk in newness of life. friends here this morning, and uh, you know, I appreciate them coming, and I uh, appreciate, you know, we've, we've gotten trouble the baptistry waters uh, often in the last couple of months. I think we need to trouble them more. What say you? Let's see some people one to Christ. If you'd stand to your feet, please, and uh, can we be dismissed with there's something mighty sweet about the Lord? Can we do that? All right, go ahead, Brother Holman. All right. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. It really doesn't matter what the world may say. There's something mighty sweet. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. There's something mighty sweet.